the only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. When you mentally prepare, understand that the mental environment and the social environment in this world is going to try you. Those of you with faith, it will try you. Spiritually, there will be an attempt to draw you in. And you must be careful not to be drawn in. So when things are going forward, please mentally prepare yourselves. Because some things in prophecy are unfolding. They have been unfolding, but not like this. Not so notable. So again, they have come to a type of agreement in Washington, D.C. Understand that these things are spiritually driven. And there's also an agreement for the Middle East. These agreements, I would advise you guys to simply watch, come to no conclusions, but understand they're spiritually driven. What was once hidden, obscured, will be very visible to those who are not going to be taken in by the seductive speech that many will hear and begin to interact with. It's not a time for anybody to hate anything. But there will be strong disagreements in the populace regarding certain aspects of the agreements that will take place with leadership. Decisions are made, and you live in that time. My advice as a brother in Christ is to mentally prepare yourselves. In a lot of cases, even in the history of all the fallen nations, they relaxed too much, way too trusting of those men put in charge of them. In this case, a simple agreement that you hear with your ears when it's not fully manifest can cause a person to relax, to drop their spiritual awareness, to begin to make plans in the world, to go forward doing what they want to do. And if you do that, you're going to be caught off guard. These agreements normally cause, spiritually, a type of relaxation in your flesh or a type of fatigue for many, for many people because they're nervous about the government and about some other issues with a spoken agreement entering into the ears of so many people they're going to feel relaxed but they shouldn't do that now is the time for a christian to actually pray that they not be deceived into joining in with the mindsets of the populace but rather that you keep the mindset of a child of god with the principles of christ and really be in your prayers understand that prophecy will never be stopped prophecy will unfold and the backlash, the spiritual backlash that you will encounter is going to be trying to you. When things are spiritual, when they become highly spiritual, it almost seems like there's a supernatural force against those who worship the Lord, who serve the cause of the gospel. Not to those who are in the world, they seem to be favored, but for those who really believe in Christ, all manner of things will seem to be on your heels and in front of your face. Don't become frightened, discouraged, or get off track by what you see. By any outcomes, you guys may see a result. You may see an outcome to what's happening in any given day. And that outcome may not be good. Don't give in to it. Stay the course. Don't allow yourselves to become emotionally entwined with the events of this world. Back away from that. You're not here to be a part of this world. You're here to intercede for this world. And for you to understand your position as a child of God is important. For far too long, many people have tried to make their way in the world. You're not here to make a way in the world. The Father didn't send you here to make a way in the world, nor did He send you here in this world to maximize in it. This is not your paradise. You really are passers-by. You're not going to be here for long. No one is. But you're here to intercede. You're here to view and to see and to learn and experience and to overcome and to walk as a child of God in this darkness. This world is not light. This world is darkness. If you're mingled in with the world and you find yourself needing to feed from the world, which means the course of your day does not go very well unless you have some media, unless you have some entertainment, it really reveals a type of necessity within you for the world. It's time to acknowledge that and to begin to combat that. What you acknowledge, you can then make a choice. Based on that choice, your Father in Heaven will overcome that area in your life for you. 
This world is seductive. Politics is seductive. Many families have broken up because of political things. If you are so inclined to be driven emotionally by politics, don't just simply turn away from politics. Overcome it. That means don't just turn your television off because you can't stand to hear it. Overcome it. You need to be able to hear all things, but nothing should be able to move you. Running away from what you hear is not overcoming it. That's simply running away. You have the victory, but all too often we don't walk in the victory. Many Christians have run just about all of their lives. They run away from things in the world, yet they fight one another. That's not the way. It's very destructive and demeaning to most. Time for us to face more than a few things and begin to overcome them. If you can hear all things, but not take everything in, you can walk through everything on the face of this earth. The word you hear should not move you emotionally. What the Lord departs to you should move you. And if the world can move you, it has a power over you. Does that make sense to you guys? Let me give you an example of what has power over you. I use this example often because most of us can understand it. One day, a person wakes up, they look in their bank account, they have an excess of $100,000. That person's in a good mood all day long. The next day they wake up, they're in the negative $10,000. That person has a bad day, a stressful day. What was the difference? What's the difference between the guy that wakes up, the person that wakes up with a lot of money, and they have a good day, and the person that wakes up, and they have a negative balance, and everything is due, and they have a bad day? What is the difference? Now, let me give you the full situation. They wake up on the 20th of the month. All bills are due on the 30th of the month. But on the 20th of the month, one wakes up and they have $100,000 in excess, which means if they pay all of their bills, they have $100,000 left over. That person has a good day. Another person wakes up, they're negative $10,000, which means on that day, because they have no income coming in that they can see, they have a rough day. They can't sleep, they can't eat. Why? Because all the bills are due on the 30th and they can see no way they can pay for them. What is the difference? Both are Christians, by the way. So what is the difference? Here's the difference. The one that wakes up with $100,000 in excess trusts in that money enough to be the answer to solve his problems, his obligations. Thus, he wakes up with a confidence and even more than a confidence, he's overjoyed because now he's empowered to gain things he wants to gain, to go out and buy what he wants to buy. So he feels empowered. He's happy because of the money, not because of the father, because of the money. The person that wakes up and their $10,000 in the red and everything is due 10 days from that day, they feel powerless. They have no idea how they're going to pay anything because there's no income coming in. And they feel like they just want to die. Why? Because in both cases, their trust is in money. It is not in God. Their happiness is tied to that money. And if they don't have that resource, if they can't see it, they throw everything away. All bets are off. So the truth is, the trust of many is in mammon, money. It is not in the Father. See, if our trust was in the Lord and we looked at our accounts and it was minus $10,000 and bills were due on the 10th, it should not move us. But that's not the case, is it? We become overwhelmed. Why? Because we don't have that power. You see, the only time we seem to be happy or joyful is when we have the power to fix our own problems, which means we do not yet trust in the resolve of the Lord. And I think that we ought to gain that very quickly. I believe that all of us have been tested time and time again. And I believe that many of us, we somewhat knew this internally, but the situation seemed to be, and did you notice that when you had no power to solve your problems, our trust is tied to things we see. Our happiness is tied to things we see. How many of you believe that the Lord is pleased with his children trusting in things of the world more than we trust in him. Let me ask you this. Imagine you had a son, and with that son, you lived a normal life, but you had an overwhelming desire to bring joy to your son's life. Well, as time went on, you were trying to teach your son something, and on occasion, you would not allow your son to have toys and things of that nature, but you would spend time with him. You would always 
arrange the house and do something so that the son could join you in doing it. And you always did that, but because the child didn't have toys, he would be in a deep depression. So you gave the child toys, and then, once he had his fill of playing with the toys, he was happy with you. He would spend time with you. So then a few days pass, and you take the toys away again. And again, the child withdraws. He does not spend time with you. And the only thing he asks of you is, can he have the toy? But you just want to spend time with him as a son. But over time, after this process, the son seems to only need you so that he can have the toy. But when he has the toy, he's then joyful, and on occasion, he'll spend time with you. But when the toy is not there, he only wants you to get the toy back. How many of you would be depressed parents if you had a child like that? And indeed, some of you feel just that way with your children. It appears they only need you to get what they want that will make them happy. Because when they don't have what they want that makes them happy, you find them spending less and less time with you. They're moping around and everything else. You know, some parents have actually said that to me. A lot of parents have said that to me. They have noticed this out of their children. These are young parents too. They say, well, when the child is playing their little video games and they can play them and it's there for them to play. Yes, they spend time on the game, but they're interactive with the family too, on occasion. But when it's time not to play the game, they mope around. And they're not very embracing of conversation with the parents. They're not embracing of each other. Only when they can play the game do they seem to have a smile on their faces when they can play their video game consoles. But when they can't play them or they have no cell phone, all they seem to want is that game or cell phone. And they will ask the parent over and over again. And they will mope around until they can obtain from the parent what they need or until the parent lets them have it. And when they finally get it, the smile comes back. But when it's gone, the smile goes away. How many of you are following what I'm saying? Because with the Lord, if we had nothing, if things were not working out, how would our relationship be with the Lord? How many of you understand what I'm saying? Does our relationship with the Lord depend upon what we have here on earth? Are we joyful with the Father only because our needs are met? What happens when our needs are not met? Well, the truth is we start moping around, don't we? It becomes an emergency. It feels like something is wrong. We're out of place, aren't we? And we ask everybody we know, pray for me so that the Father can restore what was lost. Well, a newsflash, some of you may have noticed the Lord is breaking all of us from that. But over a time span for the blessed, this is going to sound backward to most of you, but for the blessed, you have been stripped. For the blessed, you've had losses. Not for the cursed, for the blessed. See, this is where prophecy is so important to understand. See, don't you know in prophecy that those who had the most were actually the condemned? And those who were stripped of everything indeed were the blessed? Why? Because when you're stripped, you no longer have that addiction. When you're stripped of things, your joy stops coming from tangible things. And you find a relationship with the Father. Can't we understand that when Israel was stripped, their mindsets changed? They actually gained a relationship with the Lord, and they walked closer with Him, and thus they were blessed. But when they had everything, they became distant from the Lord. They became their own experts. Thus their priests drifted away from the Lord because they had too much. They were still holding their little ceremonies, but God said He was not in it, and they became an abomination to Him. Can you see in your own life what the Lord's been doing? You just don't know what's around the corner. So you can't really give him the highest praise right now in those situations because you have no idea what's around the corner. But you should have an idea because I'll say it again. Those who have been obtaining everything, they're not the blessed. The blessed are the ones who have been stripped because he wants them very close. Make no mistake. He will come back for the obedient to him, the ones who chose him. He's not coming back for the spoiled. See, the spoiled go out of the way 
the spoiled become their own experts and they cease serving God and they begin to serve one of their own man-made gods. They may still read and quote the scriptures, but it's not the father they're talking about because their confidence is in their money, in their bank account. You take away their bank account and their money and they are instantly depressed and lost. This process has been an important one for the salvation of the soul that one may keep their salvation and not fall away. You know, it somewhat gives you an idea about the falling away. How many people will say, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm suffering too much. I cannot do this religious thing anymore. That's what they'll say. And yet how many more who will be spoiled by tangible things because they've sided with this world and they'll gain from this world will say, well, God is nothing like people are saying he is. God wants you to have everything. God wants you to indulge. It sounds strange, doesn't it? It won't. Shortly, it will not. We all know the Lord is holy and well above us. We all know that his ways are holy and nothing like man's. We all know what is not at the throne of God. In all these ways of man, they're compensating, saying, God does it. One of the first things I heard when all the social media popped up and people began to talk about the Lord by the Internet is they began to say, God allows anger. What did they call it? The term was robbed from me because I don't think that way. Righteous anger. That's what they called it, righteous anger. Righteous anger, they called it, like they were righteous. How can an unrighteous person, how can we, only being righteous because the Spirit of Christ is in us, be angry and then be righteous at the same time we can't? Because the only thing that can make us righteous is the Spirit of Christ within us. Therefore, we are not righteous. He is righteous. And He is only in us because we, by faith, are in Him. There's no such thing. That is Satan's way. See, that happened in the Old Testament. The same exact thing happened as part of a process of a fall. There is no such thing as righteous anger. Anger is not justified. Anger is a human emotion driven by a frustration of one not getting their way. Anger, really, because if, if you think about it, if someone is getting beat up and it's a woman over there, and I'm a male, and I become angry, why would I be angry? Why? Can anybody answer that? I'm very protective over women and children. And I'm telling you now, it would make me angry to see a woman or a child being abused by anybody. But why would I be angry? Would it be for God or would it be for me? Think about that. It would be for me. It would be because I don't think that's the right thing to do. It would not be anything of the spirit because if God were to ever be angry with something, how could it even continue? Oh, and by the way, he's not going to be angry. He's going to be merciful and gracious because here's a fact because we think we know so much we know very little you walk around inside of a shell a shell that is exposed to tangible things you yourselves on the inside have never been touched before you will have no memory of anything that gave you trauma in this world that means you've never been touched but your flesh has you know who said that the Lord did God Almighty said that which is why when you get to the final place, you'll have no memory of anybody or anything that happened in this world that was negative to you. Right now, people are in a living type of hell because of their own memories, because they don't get to understand the simple reality of the whole situation, which is you are a spirit inside of a biological body, and that biological body is going to die or to be transformed, but you yourselves have never been touched. It's like burning your hand. You don't curse the world for the rest of your life because somebody burnt your hand, and indeed, it alters your flesh. See, with the Lord, your innocence is of your heart. Do you know that? Not talking about that stony heart you had when you were in the world of sin, but your desire towards Christ, your desire towards your Father in heaven, your desire towards those holy things of the Father. They are reserved for Him. The world can't touch the truth of you. No man, no woman can touch the truth of you. But you can act, act out your life as though something tragic has happened to you. You can keep it alive by way of your memory, which does not torment the one to the left of you or the one to the right of you. It only torments you. Why? Because you're keeping it alive. This anger is about to spread. 
more than you know. Anger will be justified by many Christians, and you'll see many go the way of Cain. But to those who really believe in Christ, they understand the power of Christ. They understand that nothing can happen unless the Lord has sanctioned it to happen. They understand that there are no accidents in anything, and that all things were purposed for the good of them that love the Lord. We read that last night, the book of Acts. We saw it in Romans, didn't we? It's the same things over and over again. So when Washington, D.C. takes everybody on a roller coaster ride, and we're not talking about men, we're talking about something spiritual, something to get the hopes up of the world, only to crush them very quickly. A surprise, something no one counted on, because the populace does not want to look. The populace wants to hear the word all clear, and then they come up and look. You should never be afraid to look, nor to hear. We can't be weak at this stage, and a weakness is only exemplified by one's ability to trust in their own answers. That is a weakness. You shouldn't be moved emotionally by anything that happens in this world, because you should realize by now that the creator of all things is in charge, and this is his creation. Thus it is his responsibility, and everybody on earth can fail. And it's still God's responsibility. We're here to make a choice. And I'm telling you that many are going to make a choice for violence. And when things go wrong in the populace, well, that's where the trouble begins. So let me give you this scenario. Again, an agreement has been made. With that agreement, people will buy into it. And then the carpet is going to be pulled out from underneath their feet. And when that takes place, people are going to be enraged. And when people become angry, because they did not get what they wanted, because someone disturbed their peace. They're going to begin to point fingers. They don't point fingers with a smile. They point fingers with violence. And if you become a part of that violence, you could potentially be lost in a gross darkness. And if you trust in the resolve of mankind and not in the resolve of your father, you're going to be on that roller coaster ride with the rest of the populace. You were never here. To have this to be your paradise. Your purpose to be here. For the sake of the gospel and the will of our Father in this earth. Because our Father still desires that no one perish outside of Him. And He granted you abilities. And He allowed you to know things. And He put you in the family you're in. That you would begin to learn and to discern. To discern is to understand the truth. If you discern a situation, you know the truth of the situation. You are not here to be deceived, beguiled. So you were tested in massive deceits and gross beguilement that you would know exactly what it is. With this decision they have made, it's going to prop up a few things, but it will quickly fall away. And as the fall away, that's where the intercession will come in. Many Christians no doubt are praying for one another. No doubt something in you is telling you a very deceitful thing is taking place. Maybe you don't know what it is. Maybe your spirit does. Maybe internally you've been crying out to the Lord on behalf of somebody else, but I'll tell you now, many people are taken in right now. Why? Because their emotions change with what they have and don't have, with the pulse of the world. And if that is the case, see, if something can take your joy away, then your joy came from that something. Do you guys understand that? If anything can take your joy away, if anything can take your hope away, then your hope and your joy was in that thing. I want you to think of your own lives and remember that. If your life is not joyful, then you, you have adopted your joy from the wrong place. If you have no hope, then the source of your hope was not in the Father, but in the wrong place. If you're walking around bitter and angry and abrasive and violent, then again, your joy, your hope and your peace were in the wrong things, they were not in the Father. See, if your joy is in the Father, nothing in this world can tamper with it. If your peace is within Christ, then nothing in this world can tamper with it. If your rest is in Jesus, nothing in this world can tamper with it. But that's not the case, is it? See, now is that time of correction for all of us to quickly reevaluate. Oh, oh, my peace has not been coming from the Lord in truth. To realize and recognize these things in your lives quickly and do something about it and put it back 
or for the first time, put it in the Lord. I mean, really sit down and take an inventory of your life and really put your hope and your peace and your joy and your rest back in the Lord. Some of you for the first time to put it in the Lord. That means to redirect your entire life right away. Take it out of the world. The world is going to fail you. You see, because in order for you to keep your joy and your hope and your peace and your rest in the world, you're going to have to accept those things in the world. And when you see what this gives way to, if you are a child of God, you'll understand with clarity. You see, there's something in the world, and all things must move. You know what happens? You know what happens in a school of fish in the ocean? You'll see them swimming. All of a sudden, you'll see them disperse. Why would they disperse? Because a bigger predator is coming. Sometimes you can see smaller shark species swimming around, terrorizing all the other fish, and then all of a sudden, they disperse. Why? Because a much larger predator has come. See, when a larger predator comes, the other predators move out of the way. When they move out of the way, it looks in the ocean like the smaller fish that were going to be eaten by those smaller predators have some sort of a reprieve. They say, hey, a time of peace is here. But what they don't understand is that the smaller predators, they went away because a larger one is coming. Who can do a thousand times more damage? Who's really going to wreak havoc? So in essence, if a great white shark had never entered into a specific reef, and all that reef had to deal with was a bunch of small predators on a very small scale, they could have been terrorized for 40 years. Then all of a sudden those predators leave. The little bitty fish might throw a parade. Hey, we've won. Something happened. Let's enjoy ourselves. But see, that's not the time to enjoy yourself. It's a time to act with sobriety, knowing that there are always predators in the water knowing that something drove away the smaller predators what they once feared something much larger they don't know of is coming and sure enough it will come because that's the only time a smaller predator leaves is when a much bigger one arrives we're going to go through that same scenario many of you may see that right now and it will not be a good ending to that story but if you join in with the parades you're going to upset yourself if you're going to have a false joy because it looks like everything is okay, you're going to upset yourself. Then when the big predator comes, many will say, well, I was deceived. No, you weren't deceived. By anything outside of you, you deceived yourself because you thought within your own mind for something to be true, and it wasn't. Because you depended upon something God said don't depend on. You know the Lord told us over and over again, do not depend on anything that you can touch or see. Do you know that? He told us, stop hoping in things you can touch and see. Only on his word. Not even voices that come into your mind or theories that are out there on paper. Do not pin your hopes to that stuff. Let it be within Christ. Because if you don't, you're going to end up being subservient to the larger predator that comes. And for those of you who really need the world's things to make you smile, to have joy. You're going to sell out to whatever comes. See, some people have made the decision that they have suffered enough and they don't want to suffer anymore. So they don't care what comes. They're going to do what they have to do to have their piece of the pie. But the children of the Lord, who are really children of the Lord, will never do that. Why won't they ever do that? Because throughout their lives, it's being broken from their lives so they can see the truth. And they're going to make a true choice for the Lord, no matter what comes. Their joy will never come from the world again after a specific time. Their hope will never come from the world again. Everything they are is going to be within Christ. They're not going to walk around being vicious and mean people. They're going to walk through things in the victory of the Lord, even when the world falls apart. They're going to be hidden in the bosom of the Lord. And that place of hiding is not running away from anything but walking through all things. See, to be hidden in the Lord is for me to still speak on air about the Lord in a time when it's illegal to speak about the Lord on air because I will obey the Lord above man always. It is for me to continue and not sit there and fear if I will be arrested or not, but to speak 
by what the Lord gives me and trust all things are in his hands so that whether I am arrested or not or killed or not, it is still in my father's choice to understand that you're not here forever, but one day you will depart. And the question will be, what did you do when you were here for the Lord? Now to do something for the Lord, that's what you do unto your brothers and your sisters. And your brothers and your sisters, by the way, may not be those who are beside you praying, but will likely be those who you see can't get it right, right now. Those of whom men have condemned, those who don't fit. Let me share this with you. There are people out there in the world that the world hates, but so do the Christians. I heard something the other day, and I hear this often. There are people out there with real issues. The world wants nothing to do with them. But they also say that everybody comes to them telling them, condemning them for what they're doing. But on occasion, somebody comes to them and will simply tell them this, brother or sister, you know it's you Christ died for because he loves you. And do you not realize that's changing people's lives? Not some big long sermon on what they're doing wrong. They already know what they're doing wrong. See, the statement is that people are always approaching them from the church with condemnation or a false type of caring, saying, come to the church and bring some money. And they already know about that. They said, but it's rare that anybody comes to them in love. And that's what's keeping them, drawing them. When people come to them with love, they can already see the false love. These folks know false love. They can hear fake love. See, if they hear you talk about one person, they're not coming to you because they'll say, nope, that person has false love. They just condemned another one of their own and they're going to tell me they love me, but they condemn the other. We do that in the world. That person does not have love in them. Oops. Yes, they hear that way. That's how they see people in the church. Why? Because they're among vipers already. So they're going to know vipers in the church if they're there. You can't condemn one and love the other. And they hear that. But when somebody comes to them in love, they really hear that. And that's exactly what they're looking for. These are the ones who the world has pushed out and the Christians will not accept. Those are the ones that were appointed for us to give out the gospel to. Those are the ones that are going to be saved. The ones who have no place. At any rate, there are lots of those folks out there and you're here on their behalf. So in the very end, when the Lord says, what did you do for me? And I'm painting a picture here. Because isn't that going to be the question? What did you do for the Lord? See, the truth is, you can't do anything for the Lord unless you do it to a person on this earth. Do you know that? What can you do for the Lord that you, that you cannot do for your brother and sister? Somebody name one thing. Because the Lord said, it works just that way. Whatever you do to the least you've done unto him. And whatever you fail to do for the least, you fail to do unto him. So then to serve God is not to serve him directly. To serve God is to serve your brothers and your sisters in truth. You know how many people have manipulated other folks, played like they were serving God, but all they wanted was something out of people. What can they tell the Lord? People who are out there profiteering, of somebody else's brokenness, what are they going to tell them? Please don't be one of those folks, but rather sell it in your hearts of what's really going on. Open your eyes and look. Settle the matter now before anything takes place. Think about it soberly and settle it. Don't turn away and handle it later. Later will no longer come. Settle it now. That will be a dividing line because the angels shall come and harvest the earth. They'll do that soon. And by the way, that's before Jesus comes, just in case you didn't know. And during that harvest, many things will have taken place. And you live in those times of, you know what? The times will evolve as such that no one's going to care who said what, about what, what came true and what didn't. No one is going to care. The average person out there, the populace, they're going to run to anybody that can save their skins. A lot of folks out there are going to find and try to find a believer, but they're going to have a hard time doing it. They will search desperately for a real believer, not for a phony. See the nature of what's evolving. First, in the realm of 
tangible things, and then the unbelievable, the thing that nobody could imagine. And I'm not talking about the beast yet, nor the Antichrist. I'm talking about something before the Antichrist, sorrow upon sorrow for those who rejected Christ because they have no shield, because they have no clothing, they have no protection, and without dying they will surely die. And they chose. See, we've had a lifetime, haven't we, to really make a decision so that when the Lord does what he does, none of us can say, I needed more time. We will know that the Lord gave us ample time. We will have chosen what we will have chosen. That's why the Lord's children walk around with a great caution within them. And the truth is this. Many of us, before we actually were sober about the entire situation, really walked around so I'm just so worried about everybody else, as though we were perfect, like we never did anything wrong, or that we're conforming to everything right. In truth, that's not who we are inside. When the Lord comes, we're not going to be thinking about somebody else. We're going to say, oh, my Lord, have I done? Have I been really pleasing to you? We're going to start thinking along those lines. See, for me to sit there and worry about everybody else is to imply that I've done everything right, that I am so confident that I'm going with the Lord. I am no longer taking inventory of my own life. That's not the truth. The truth is this. Every day of my life, I am looking at my life. I'm not turning away from anything that I do, but seeking to get my life pleasing unto the Lord. And by doing so, he adds to me things. He allows me to help others from time to time. He permits me to speak about his word from time to time. But make no mistake, there is not one moment in my life that I will sit there and say, oh, I've made it, but poor you. No, in the truth of all of our hearts, we know that one day we're going to stand before the Lord and give account of our own lives. See, I'm not a denier of my own wrongness, of the things I've done wrong. I don't walk around in a cloud thinking somehow everything is perfected. I've seen people say, well, so long as I have Christ, everything is okay. No, it isn't, because you have to make choices every moment of your life. And the Lord said, he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. The Lord said, if they run, if they do not faint, to faint is to give up. Do you know how many times over the course of my life I had it in me, Lord, I, I don't know if I can do this another moment. There have been times of, of excruciating pain inflicted on me by some other person for walking in the ways of the Lord. Physical pain. You know what I said in that moment? I was thinking, is this worth it or not? Imagine some, just imagine it this way. Most of you have had a toothache. So imagine you with the word of God and you knew that every time that you would go and tell the gospel, you would have a toothache. How many of you would continue to tell the gospel? Because when you had that toothache, you would have done anything to take that pain away. You stopped talking. You stopped communicating. You may have thrown something over in the corner when the pain hit. You tossed and turned in the bed. You hung upside down. You tried everything. So just imagine if that same pain, discomfort, and torment would be at your doorstep every time you carry the gospel. How many would boldly go out there? Well, I'm going to take it everywhere. See, they're not thinking soberly. Daily we are crucified. Those who carry the gospel, you think it's pleasant to your senses or the flesh. No, it isn't. You think someone actually gets used to it? No, they don't. They still have to face it. See, the question is, are you truly committed to it? Because the only way to be committed to it is to really understand it and the benefit of it to somebody else. So the question is, would you have an abscess for somebody else, would you? And would you do that for every person you encounter? Say, oh, that makes it different. I said this one time years ago, and somebody said, well, that, that just makes it too real. I don't think anybody would do that. That's the entire point. Based on that response that I've heard multiple times, I don't think anybody would do that. If the, you know, if that's just too much for anybody to bear, God wouldn't do that. Really? How many, their whole life has been an abscess? But you know what? That's the difference between walking by the Spirit and walking by the flesh. Because when you walk by the Spirit, 
and you're in pain like that, you can push forward for the sake of somebody else. You can only do that by way of love. See, if you don't have love, you're not going to do it, period. You're not going to suffer anything. Now, let me put that into context for you. I'll say it one more time. When you go forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ by way of love, you will suffer anything and everything. But if you don't go forward in love, how can you have the gospel? You can speak all the words, it's still not the gospel. So here's what's happened. You have folks out there who get talked about, and what do they do? They start breaking, or they're just talking about me too much. I'm not going to do it. They're not going forward in love. Because when you go forward in love, you don't care who talks about you. You care about those who need it. You're after those who need it. You don't care what comes. You start laying down everything. You lose everything so that one person can receive the gospel. But when you're doing it by flesh, without the love of God, anything can discourage you. You guys understand that. These are days of sobriety for all of us. This isn't some Disney story. This is a real story. Doing things by love. That's your motivation to push through because you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for somebody else. And you can only push through if you really have love in your heart. If you don't have that love in your heart, anything will discourage you. I've heard all sorts of comments from plenty of folks. Well, no one, no one prays for me. No one does this for me. No one does that for me. No one does this for that for me. When you hear that, how can anybody say that if they have committed in their hearts to do what they do by love? It's, it's, I'm telling you a difference because there are plenty of cases that many of us did not go out in love and were corrected because there every day you may feel no one loves you. You may perceive that, but this is a spiritual walk. It's not a walk by by your eyes or by sensations of the flesh this is for real once you have the love of god in you you can't help but to love your neighbor as yourself you can't help but to love your enemy and it doesn't matter what comes against you because you're not doing it for you you've committed yourself to do something for somebody else you become a tool for the father that means you you don't go out to harm anybody you have the will of god in your mind and in your soul and what is the will of god that that good news go to everybody that so long as they have breath they can change therefore you don't condemn anybody any evil deed we do is already condemned by god we should know that there's no need for me to condemn because the lord said everybody knows what they're doing they just have not made the choice to commit themselves to that walk of the spirit yet and only by having the gospel can they do that and again in order to carry the gospel out and be persecuted at the same time without complaining. You can only do that by love. Just like an infant. Mothers, when you rushed to do something for that infant in the middle of the night after you were fatigued and with the flu, but because your baby needed something, you responded by love. You know what love always says inside? It always puts another well above you. You will risk everything for the sake of that one. Mothers will risk it all for the sake of that infant. They, the mother doesn't matter to herself in those moments. Nobody matters but that infant. Her health does not matter. Whether she's fed or not does not matter. Doesn't matter what anybody's advice is. It doesn't matter what anybody says. She does not go through cursing everybody out to get to the baby. No, nope. when you're determined to get to a person, you have little to say to anybody else by way of a negative thing. You're so focused on getting to the baby that you go through all obstacles. And if a wall was in the way, you'd go through it. And if somebody said, don't do it because of this, you wouldn't care. Fear can't stop you. Because where that strong and where that determination of love is, fear cannot exist. Fear can never exist where love is. I'm giving you guys a key. Because see, most people say, well, I'm gonna be scared when these times come, not if your motivation is love. You don't know what your own fire is, do you? You've tried every other way to perform something by way of the Lord, and you found fear at every single door. There's one way to walk with those things of the Lord where fear cannot operate. When your heart and when that love in you is set on somebody else, do you not know fear can never get in the way because it won't work. It cannot fully form. It can't do anything. That is God's love, which is an unconditional, unbreakable love. When you have that in your heart towards somebody else, 
That's a no-touch zone for fear. Fear can operate there. Hatred does not operate there. Nothing operates there except love and determination. Consequently, that's where the power of the living God occupies in love. That's why the scripture says God is love. But that's something the carnal mind will never decipher. And indeed, the carnal mind does not like that statement, nor can it comprehend it. Because the carnal mind and those who walk after the flesh cannot comprehend why God is love. And if God is love, then all things of God are by way of love. And if God is love, then the gospel is love. That's why it's the good news. But love is not a feeling. Don't you know that what you feel in your bodies is a residue of that power of love? Love is the Father focused upon somebody else's. Is that good intention, that pure intention upon somebody else and that feeling you feel is the residue of it passing through you towards somebody else. Don't you know that? See, you've never felt better, nor have you had a greater reward than when you, without anybody knowing, truly did something for somebody else. See, it didn't matter how they received it. It mattered that you could do it. When you really assisted someone, when you really did that out of love, if you can remember, you didn't look for a return. You didn't look for a thank you or anything else. The reward you received was that you really gave it. That is the love of God. All this other stuff is a conditional mindset, a construct of the carnal mind, an attempt to understand what love is. That's why men without the spirit of the living God have so many definitions of love and so many descriptions. There's one description of love. You want to know what it is? The Father. The carnal mind, if you try to interpret the Old Testament by the carnal mind, you'll swear down that can't be the God of love. That has to be another God. That's because you're trying to interpret the Word of God with your carnal mind, and you can't do that. The Word of God must be discerned or understood spiritually. It cannot be understood with the carnal mind. In this time, you're meant to carry the Spirit of the living God upon yourselves, which, by the way, is love. Which is why some of you are so highly compassionate. What you didn't know is that's not yours to do with as you want to do. But that's in you that when you're instructed, nothing can stop you. See, what God has called you to do, nothing has the power to stop it. Don't you know that? That's why you're so compassionate. But what you've been doing is trying to justify why that's in you by doing everything you can do. Responding to it by what you see with the eye. It doesn't work that way, and it hasn't ever worked that way. Which is why some of your acts of compassion have turned into horror stories, and it made you bitter, not the other person. Some of your acts of compassion have gotten you in trouble, not because of the Lord, because you tried to utilize what God put in you for your own plan and based on what you saw with the eye. Well, now you know these agreements will begin a process that won't turn back. It is extremely deceitful. It will appear to be one thing that will quickly dissolve into something else. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.